Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to class. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'd like to begin with prayer. Is there a volunteer to provide? Please. Amen. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, a brief update. Uh, the grading of exam one is going well. Some actually have been completed and they will shortly appear in, um, in the bins beneath our display case. This Display case is found in the main east-west hallway of the Benson Building. It's just west of the uh, large glass doors that are the main entrances from the south and north. Uh, our display case is on the north side of that hallway. The display case has a, a, a little placard with our class name in it. Beneath the display case are bins that are alphabetized. That is where the exams will appear. The balance of the exams should be available and in the bins, um, the vast majority by Wednesday uh, late. So, um, so please look over those. If there are issues that have to do with simply the totaling of points, please take those to the TAs. If, if there's a simple, um, something that can be easily handled by the TAs, then by all means use them. If it's something that's more complicated, uh, then you're welcome to contact me and we can uh, discuss the, uh, your question or issue. Are there any questions about that? All right, um, we have been talking about lipids. This is this uh, extremely broad category of biomolecules. The unifying factor for these is that they are hydrophobic compounds. 
Uh, <clears throat> and there are many different categories and classes of lipids. Their chemical structures are highly different and not surprisingly, their biological functions are also quite varied. Uh, we left uh, off talking about a group of lipids termed steroids, and in particular, steroid hormones. These are compounds that are derived from cholesterol. That is to say the cholesterol is the uh, precursor compound for the formation of the steroid hormones. And uh, they, there are several enzymes that will process the, the um, cholesterol in different ways to produce this series of steroid hormones. Uh, um, I will uh, use, uh, I'm going to uh, use the board to kind of describe how, uh, what chemical features differentiate the steroid hormones one from another. There are five categories of steroid hormones and I will sort of outline the basic features of each of these five different categories. This same information is found on slides, on the slides, um, and we'll, I'll show you that in just a minute. So uh, I'm going to, let's see, let me, um, I guess, I hope everybody can see that. Let's see, maybe I should. that help? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so as mentioned, <clears throat> all of these compounds uh, are derived from, oops, sorry. Uh, are derived from cholesterol. So uh, let's walk through this. Uh, the cholesterol back, uh, the, the, uh, the cholesterol is characterized by this four ring of member fused ring system <clears throat> that looks as follows. And <clears throat> And this is sort of the basic, um, this is called the sterile backbone. <clears throat> so uh, among these are, these steroid hormones are the estrogens. So estrogens uh, are characterized as follows. They have a 17 hydroxyl group. This is not unique to estrogens, but it is a necessary a feature of estrogens. They also have an aromatic A ring. So the rings go A, B, C, D. And they have additionally a three hydroxyl group. Uh, so cholesterol has a three hydroxyl group. The OL the, of cholesterol references this three hydroxyl group. So steroids that have these basic features, the aromatic A-ring, 3-hydroxyl, 17-hydroxyl, allow for, uh, provide for estrogenic activity. And there are many, there, there are natural estrogens, by far and away the uh, most common, at least in the human, is 17-hydroxy uh, um, estradiol. There are synthetic estrogens as well. Uh, okay, so this then would be typical of uh, an estrogen. Let's move on to androgens. Androgens then are the male hormone. The most common of these is testosterone for men, men. but for women, it's dehydroepiandosterone. Just rolls off the tongue, but uh, nevertheless, let's consider then the features 
that give rise to androgenic activity. And this portion of the steroid backbone remains the same, surprisingly. The difference is found down here, and <clears throat> it involves a double bond here and a keto group here. So three keto, four five ene. You don't have to remember these particular numberings, but you should know the features that give rise to androgen activity. So when people talk about steroid abuse in baseball or the Olympics, they are talking about variants of the androgen uh, of the androgen molecule. Okay, so this uh, this particular structure then is uh, modified in various ways by different people to provide androgens. Okay. Any questions about this? So these are probably the two easiest to uh, distinguish. Let's consider now um, the uh, a, a group of uh, uh, steroid hormones termed gluco corticoids, okay? Gluco uh, uh, in the sense that these compounds promote gluco, glucose synthesis within the organism. So the body, our bodies have the ability to generate glucose and that process is called gluconeogenesis in glucocorticoids promote that particular activity. Um, these compounds have this same general structure for the A ring, this 3 keto 4 5 ene, but they differ uh, on the D ring in that, um, let me just draw this a little differently, they have a two carbon extension. So this is carbon 20 and 21. On carbon 20, they have a keto group on carbon 21, they have a hydroxyl. And they still maintain this 17 hydroxyl species, okay? So three keto, four, five, ene, 17 hydroxy, 21 hydroxy in this 20 ketone uh, species. Now uh, this is the, the general structure of these. There's, uh, there's also in cortisol, which is the most common of these, this is our body's primary glucocorticoid, there is an 11 hydroxy group as well. Okay. The 11 hydroxy group is seemingly less critical for having glucocorticoid activity, given that there are synthetic glucocorticoids that omit the 11 hydroxy. So these are glucocorticoids. Um, these are used actually quite commonly in medicine. In fact, they've been in the news lately. Individuals with severe COVID-19 are being given dexamethasone, which is an analog, a, a, a modified a glucocorticoid that is very potent. And the rationale is to prevent the body from overreacting to the infection and uh, putting the individual into uh, a, what is called a cytokine storm, where their body produces such uh, an inflammatory response that effectively um, it's, it's a little bit like having an asthma attack and the, uh, the small uh, um, chambers of the lung fill up with liquid and the person suffocates. So, all right, glucocorticoids. We're going to talk about another category of steroid hormones called uh, the mineralocorticoids. Mineral is, uh, is referring to the ability of these steroids to promote sodium reabsorption. Uh, in many parts of the world, sodium salt is actually quite rare. And uh, for example, in 
Saharan and Sub-Saharan Africa, there is actually remarkably little uh, salt in the Earth's crust. And they used to actually import salt all the way from Europe. It was a very lucrative trade. So Salzburg uh, in Austria had these vast salt mines and they would mine the salt and transport it all the way to Africa where they would trade it for um, things of great value in Europe. Okay, uh, to be able to have a mineralocorticoid, we retain um, the three keto, four, five, ene, 20 keto, 21 hydroxyl, but now we add an 18 aldehyde, very unique but it is this 18 aldehyde that gives rise to the mineralocorticoid activity. Okay. So these, uh, these hormones act in the renal tubule, the distal tubule. They promote uh, the production and insertion of a transporter that allows for sodium to be taken up from the forming urine and put back into the circulation. So uh, the primary mineralocorticoid is called aldosterone or aldosterone, depending on where you went to school. And this uh, the levels of aldosterone will be increased during times of, uh, of substantial uh, sweating and uh, minimal water intake. Uh, this will go up to try to conserve sodium in the body. <clears throat> okay, final category are the progestins. The progestins are a female hormone, part of the uh, menstrual cycle, important for uh, ovulation. Uh, the progestins uh, are similar in many ways to the compounds we've just talked about. Again, they have the three keto, four, five ene. They lack a 17 hydroxyl. They lack a 21 hydroxyl, but they do retain the 20 keto species. So you're asking, what do I need to know for the exam? Uh, will I have to draw these crazy structures? No, you, you won't, but you might be asked to identify or categorize a, <clears throat> a, a figure, a, a picture of a steroid hormone. Is it an androgen? Is it a mineral or corticoid? Or there is a slide that summarizes the uh, structural features uh, that are critical for a particular type of activity, you might need to know the information in that slide. Okay. Questions? Let's uh, stop here because now we're going to move on to this uh, special topic. Yes? Progestin. Yes, progesterone is the primary uh, progestin in humans, uh, but there are others that are found, so yes. All right, um, I'm now going to move to slides. Um, again, apologies, um, you know, this is sometimes not, uh, not ideal, but um, So we are uh, going to consider cortisol. Cortisol is this glucocorticoid. It is a stress hormone. It is increased in almost all kinds of stress. Everything from exertional stress, uh, emotional stress. Uh, it takes its name from the fact that it is increased in response to hypoglycemia, low blood sugar, 
and stimulates gluconeogenesis, the production, the body's production of glucose. We're going to talk about its normal functioning within the body and uh, how it is regulated. We'll talk a little bit about its uh, secretory patterns. And we're going to talk about its uh, physiologic effects. And then we're going to talk about a series of diseases that are characterized by excess, chronic excess cortisol. <clears throat> and these are uh, broadly termed Cushing's syndrome. And we'll talk about these uh, in some detail. Okay, so just a recap. Uh, this is a glucocorticoid structure. Again, uh, as mentioned, let me just walk you through those features again that are important. Uh, we have this three keto group, this four five ene. We have this 17 hydroxyl, a 20 keto, a 21 hydroxyl, and cortisol uh, has additionally this 11 hydroxyl as mentioned. The 11 hydroxyl seems to be um, less critical for glucocorticoid activity. This is something you will not need to know, uh, but within the adrenal, uh, the uh, cortisol is synthesized. Again, as mentioned, the starting material for this synthetic process is cholesterol. And if we don't have cholesterol, it is, it is an unsustainable situation. A, a person would die without cholesterol. Too much cholesterol is uh, understood to be problematic and harmful, but a certain amount of cholesterol is necessary for life. <clears throat> um, what you see here are lots of uh, structures and lots of enzymatic steps. Cortisol requires five steps to be uh, produced, uh, to allow for the production, its production from cholesterol. You don't need to know these steps, just that the synthesis is rather complicated and takes place in the adrenal, specifically in a series of cells called fasciculata cells. There may be a little bit of uh, production of um, cortisol in the uh, reticular cells, but the primary cell for the production of cortisol are the fasciculata cells. There are other cells in the adrenal. The, um, the reticular cells are primarily responsible for the generation of an androgen called dehydroepiandosterone and its sulfate. DHEA, DHEA sulfate, these are the primary androgens in women. And they do contribute to androgens in men, although the testes uh, produce far more testosterone than do the adrenals. The, uh, there is an additional type of cell in the adrenal called the glomerulosa cell, and that is where the mineralocorticoid aldosterone is produced. So this is a very, uh, and there's also the medulla, the adrenal medulla, where catecholamines, epinephrine, which we call adrenaline, uh, norepinephrine, and uh, dopamine are Produced. So it's a very complicated organ. It's small, it's about the size of your finger, uh, your thumbnail, and sits on top of your kidneys, uh, sort of in the lower part of your back. Okay. So let me introduce you to something called an endocrine feedback loop. Cortisol is a, an important compound and as is invariably the case where there is, where something important is being produced, something that has very broad activity, it is highly regulated. 
And so we're going to consider this uh, regulation and, um, and that's what is presented in the slide. So we're going to talk about three organs. We're going to talk about the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus, if you put your fingers on your temples, maybe one finger at the top of the bridge of your nose, where those intersect, you would find your pituitary gland. It's sort of a pea-sized uh, organ. Sitting on top of it is the hypothalamus, a very small uh, organ, but very, very important in terms of hormonal regulation for, uh, for the body. The hypothalamus produces a tripeptide hormone called corticotropin releasing hormone or corticotropin releasing factor. Either name is sufficient. They both mean the same thing. And this hormone is released and makes its way to the pituitary through what's termed a portal circulation. It's actually a small tube that interconnects the hypothalamus to the pituitary. So CRH, the corticotropin releasing hormone, does not enter the general circulation. It is limited to this portal circulation. It is directed immediately and, uh, and directly to the pituitary. <clears throat> it has a tonic effect. It is going to increase the pituitary's release of another hormone, termed corticotropin releasing, uh, corticotropin, adrenal corticotropin hormone, sorry, ACTH, adrenal corticotropin hormone. Uh, the ACTH now does enter the circulation. So it starts up here in the brain and it makes its way in the general circulation to the adrenal. Remember the adrenals are in the small of your back sitting on top of your kidneys. They're sort of lima bean sized uh, organs that are there. The ACTH, the adrenal corticotropin hormone, uh, is then uh, going to stimulate the adrenal to produce cortisol. It's also going to cause the adrenal to uh, release androgens. So both the cortisol and the DHEA are under ACTH control. So increasing ACTH leads to increased cortisol production, increased uh, <clears throat> uh, DHEA, and uh, these enter the circulation. You'll notice on this slide now that as the ACTH increases and stimulates cortisol over here, the cortisol actually feeds back at the level of the pituitary and at the level of the hypothalamus to inhibit uh, the CRH, CRF, and the ACTH. So it's a little bit like a thermostat. As the heat goes up, it reaches a certain level and it causes the furnace to turn off. The same thing is happening here. As cortisol levels rise to a certain concentration, they bring about the inhibition uh, uh, of the hypothalamic CRH and the pituitary ACTH, causing now the cortisol levels to fall. As the cortisol levels fall sufficiently, the, the inhibition that they impose on the hypothalamus and the pituitary are relieved. And these organs now begin to synthesize and release CRH and ACTH and stimulate increased levels of cortisol. I don't think that the androgens feed back on the hypothalamus and pituitary. I think it is cortisol that is the 
is this inhibitor of uh, the release of CRH and ACTH. Okay, let's pause here and take your questions. Yes? When you say CRH, on this line it says CRF, is there a difference? There is no difference. As I mentioned, it, it is called both corticotropin releasing hormone or corticotropin releasing factor. One and the same, you'll see them both, um, both, both, both used. So, sorry, yes? What did you say DHEA stands for? Uh, DHEA is dehydroepiandosterone. It is an androgen. It is not as potent as testosterone, but it is the primary androgen in women. So axillary hair growth is under the HEA control. Uh, other features, physical and physiologic features, uh, are under the HEA control in women. So, um, so that's what that is. Yes. yes. So then, how is this different in men versus women? It's not. It's just that men have a secondary, well, it's not a secondary, they have a, a different, a second source of androgens, which are the testes, okay? So they independently in their gonads produce testosterone. Okay. So. Other questions? Yes? It would cause disease, and we're actually going to spend most of Wednesday talking about Cushing's because that is exactly what happens. There are, um, it, it's not a, exactly a breakdown in, the, uh, in this endocrine loop, but there are tumors that are, um, they, they are not well controlled by the normal mechanisms that are shown here. So we'll talk specifically about that. But yes, it leads to disease. And it turns out that maybe you know, and maybe you've heard of people who are on steroids for, um, for autoimmune disease or for inflammatory disease or for um, who have uh, severe uh, reactive airway disease um, and get occasionally or maybe frequently uh, <clears throat> glucocorticoids. Things such as prednisone and prednisolone, these are commonly used in the clinical setting and they do reduce, let's say, allergic reactions. They do reduce uh, tissue rejection. They do reduce uh, these autoimmune problems like rheumatoid arthritis or uh, systemic lupus, erythritosis, these, these autoimmune disease can be, at least in the short run, uh, they can be treated using these glucocorticoids. The issue is that you can't use these for prolonged periods of time because you then actually generate disease. Uh, you just, you generate severe side effects. Okay. Other questions about this? Yes. What's the aldosterone? What's the the aldosterone is our primary mineralocorticoid. It is primarily under angiotensin II control. It's also under potassium control. It is, it is uh, at least in the... Um, acutely, that is uh, briefly, it is under ACTH control. So ACTH will, in, uh, it is produced in the glomerulosa cells. It leads to salt reabsorption in the kidney. It uh, is increased at least initially with ACTH, but that stimulation is quickly lost. In a matter of hours, the uh, the glomerulosa cells will cease to produce more aldosterone in response to ACTA. So it is not the primary or long-term regulator of aldosterone, but it does in the short term give rise to increased aldosterone as well. Okay. <clears throat> 
The ACTH is a peptide hormone. The CRH or CRF is also a peptide hormone. Uh, the CRH is just a tripeptide, three amino acids. It is able to uh, have its own receptor and bring about the release of the ACTH in the pituitary. The ACTH uh, leaving the pituitary has this general structure. You don't need to know this, it's just that it is a peptide. What is interesting, or at least becomes a little bit relevant as we talk about uh, Cushing's, is that it shares some amino acid homology with other hormones derived from this uh, much larger molecule that is the precursor of <clears throat> ACTH called POMC. I'm not going to, uh, anyway, it, it, the, what's shown here are seven amino acids that are shared with another hormone called melanocyte stimulating hormone alpha. It is the hormone that is responsible for pigmentation in our skin. And this will become relevant as we talk about uh, Cushing's disease. So just tuck that away. Okay, I want to talk now about the release of both ACTH and cortisol. Uh, what is shown in this slide are the circulating levels, concentrations of ACTH. So remember, the pituitary releases ACTH into the general circulation, and it stimulates the adrenals to produce cortisol and androgens. You notice that it is a very messy uh, plot. That is to say there are substantial spikes and troughs that happen throughout the day. This represents 24 hours of clock time and concentrations of ACTH on the y-axis. Um, it turns out that um, the ACTH uh, generates the same kind of pulsatile, highly variable release of cortisol from the adrenal, but the cortisol changes uh, are delayed about one to two hours after the ACTH levels go up or down. Um, let me show you. Uh, it's a little hard to pick out here, but the cortisol levels are the open circles. So let me just kind of trace this here. So you'll notice that we have a spike here and then a trough and we go up and then there is this sort of general increase in cortisol levels that reach their peak in a normal individual at about 6 to 8 a.m. Just as you are getting up, assuming upright posture, and beginning work. So remember, this is a stress hormone, and the body is, the presumption is, is preparing you for the work day, okay? So upright posture, uh, physical activity, all of these then uh, are benefited by having higher levels of cortisol. You'll notice that it drops off quite dramatically, and uh, by noon, we're sort of down at a trough, a nadir, and then it stays relatively low until uh, it starts to be evening as we start to uh, conclude the day. Now, within the day, there can be spikes. These can be due to, let's say you're skipping lunch and by five in the afternoon, you're somewhat hypoglycemic. Or you take the biochem exam and suddenly you are stressed, okay, and your levels go up. Or you go outside and it's very cold and windy. That, that is also a stress, just of cold, and that will send your uh, cortisol levels up. Virtually any kind of stress will give rise to higher levels of 
cortisol. But you'll notice that this is a very messy pattern. There, it would be very hard to, to determine if somebody had too much or too little cortisol based on a single blood draw during the day. Uh, you wouldn't know if somebody had too much, had excess, had uh, some sort of tumor with AC excess, excess uh, cortisol production. You simply would not be able to make that determination by drawing blood uh, a single time. So uh, the cortisol is also very important in our sense of well-being, our, our, our sense of energy. Uh, for example, it turns out that if we move to a different time zone, let's say that we fly to Europe, maybe you don't want to right now, but let's say that you did and you're now several hours out of sync with the, um, with the, the normal daylight uh, patterns that you've been used to. When your body gets out of sync with uh, the external environment, you experience changes in, you have disruption of your cortisol cycles. And this gives rise to this sense of, of uh, jet lag, okay? So uh, your body tries to adjust, but it takes several days for it typically to adjust to a new environment. So if you go to Europe, it might take you a couple days before you are really awake uh, at the beginning of the day over there. Uh, and you may have trouble staying awake uh, in the late afternoon or evening when uh, your body's rhythm is uh, undergoing changes consistent with the time zone here in Utah, let's say. Uh, this, this is a problem for people who do shift work. Uh, they found that people who operate nuclear power plants frequently are effectively asleep uh, at three in the morning or four in the morning because their cortisol patterns are out of sync with their trying to stay awake. Uh, their cortisol is synced with their, with this, you know, this rising and setting of the sun outside. It's also an issue for uh, people who grow older. Grandma may report that she only needs four or five hours of sleep, that she just wakes up spontaneously at five in the morning and is up and about, and, you know. Um, well, it turns out that uh, in the elderly, this uh, rise uh, in cortisol levels happens earlier. It's shifted, and so they they do wake up and they do feel okay uh, fairly early in the morning. But by afternoon, even though she doesn't report it, she's sitting watching the TV, TV but she's sound asleep. Okay, or at least maybe her eyes are open, but for all other purposes, she's sound asleep. Same is true in the opposite direction for teenagers. They, uh, their uh, cortisol levels rise later. There is a delay. And so they're not really effectively awake until maybe third period. Okay, so the first period, second period of the day, for all practical purposes, they're sound asleep. And it's really hard for them to focus. It's really hard for them to feel well, do well in, at those early hours. So um, our, our being in, uh, our, our body's able to entrain the circadian rhythm to sleep-wake cycles, to light-dark cycles. Um, and it's really important that they be correctly uh, tuned or it does create this kind of uh, inability to stay awake when we would like to or we are waking up when we really wish we could get a few more hours sleep. Yes? Does cortisol or does caffeine affect the cortisol levels? It, it doesn't, but it does produce certain kinds of stimulation. It may 
give you a little more, it, it's not going to help you with the exam if you are, you know, if you were to try to take an exam at three in the morning, you could take quite a bit of caffeine, it would prevent you from falling asleep, but it's not going to really help you think clearly and well, so. Okay, I, I think I'm going to end it here. We'll come back and talk about the, physiolo the physiologic effects of cortisol next time and about Cushing's and uh, the features of Cushing's, um, which represent this really broad, uh, broad spectrum of biological activity that the cortisol has. Let me see if I can move this story substantially forward, maybe finish this today. So I was going to basic training. Let me put the screen down here. Maybe it will be better. OK. So uh, as mentioned, I was going to basic training for Jackson, South Carolina. It was tough. It was hot. It, we were being worked hard. We were being treated poorly. Uh, we were away from family and friends. Uh, and it really was a very stressful situation. And I desperately wanted to go to church. And I had tried. I, uh, the first week there, no way to find any information. Second week there, I was given the opportunity to look for the church services on base, but couldn't find them. The third Sunday, I was getting very desperate at this point. My platoon sergeant actually took me to the building where the services were to be, and no one was there. Although, uh, after we'd been there about 10 minutes, there was a car pull up, and this gentleman, a, a member of the church, uh, introduced himself and indicated that church services were being held off base in uh, Columbia, and that he would come and fetch me the following Sunday and take me to church. Well, that was all well and good until the next day, Monday, we found out that we were going to have guard duty. Every person in that company was going to have guard duty the following Sunday. No exceptions, no excuses, no, uh, no passes to go off and go to church. I was really devastated. I was starting to doubt. I was starting to grumble, murmur. Um, I was starting to be put out at, uh, at my Heavenly Father because I wanted to do something that I was commanded to do. I had made a conscientious effort to get it done and nothing was working out. So we spent that week getting ready. <clears throat> we got our a set of fatigue starts, and we polished our belt buckles and shined our shoes. And we, Sunday morning came, and we were standing out in formation. We were being inspected by the captain, by the first sergeant. Um, we were all there, 250 of us, standing out in formation in, uh, on this kind of road. It's just paved uh, strip in front where uh, we would sometimes march and do drills, but it was primarily for us to stand in formation. So everybody's gathered there, and right in the middle of this, up pulls this cart, right in front of everybody, right up to the captain of the company, and stops, and out gets this gentleman from the church. And he announces in a very loud voice, I'm here to pick up uh, Miss Brother Graves. And uh, at this point, the company commander goes ballistic. He starts screaming my name. He calls me out of formation. He, he's reading me up one side and down the other in unkind terms that I can't repeat. And uh, asking what in the is going on and what do I think I'm doing? And, you know, I am, I'm, I wish I, I was hoping I could crawl in a hole. I mean, it was in front of everybody, every sergeant, every, you know, everybody was there watching this drama go on. <clears throat> and fortunately, my platoon sergeant came up and explained the situation and was able to kind of calm the company commander down. 
And, um, but uh, there, I still had guard duty, you know, and everybody had guard duty. And so this gentleman had come all the way on base. I had no way to contact him. I didn't even know his name or phone number. Or, there's no phone available to any of us uh, at this point. Anyway, finally, the company commander calls over uh, the duty sergeant, uh, a sergeant who has the roster of all of the assignments. And he said, okay, where's the assignment? So, you know, here are 250 names. Every individual has an assignment. And he starts down this list. He has to find me in all of this uh, long list of names. And uh, after a while, he said, well, that's strange. And the company commander said, what's strange? Well, he said that his guard post has been canceled. And the company commander says, give me that. He grabs that and says, what do you mean it's been canceled? What do they do? They take the PA, PX away? The, you know, the, anyway, he goes down the list and sure enough, my particular assignment had been canceled. The company commander had never in his many years in the service had a guard post canceled. Nobody else that day had their guard post canceled. I believed then and I believe now that it was an answer to prayer. That it was this small, well maybe not so small miracle of then being able to go to church. The com company commander said, well I guess if you don't have an assignment, I guess there's no reason you can't go to church. And so I was able to go to church and I was able to go to church thereafter for uh, every Sunday that I was in uh, basic training and advanced training. I think sometimes we are commanded to do things and we make an honest, concerted effort to accomplish them. And things just don't seem to work out. They just don't seem to happen despite our best efforts. And I think sometimes we are being taught the value of the very thing that we are trying to obtain. I never would have valued going to church as much as I did once I had had this experience. Some things come very slowly and some things take a long time. But I think it is our Heavenly Father teaching us the value of that blessing once it is received. Something to think about. Thank you very much. Sorry to keep you over a minute.